All right. Hello, Anna. Hello, Noah. Uh, congratulations on the release of Insilico. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here and doing this. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And thank you to the Roxy, uh, which is my local movie theater and a San Francisco gem. Um, so I kind of wanted to jump in and just sort of get the background to this film. And I was hoping that you could put us in your shoes circa 2009. Um, you just graduated from college. You were studying neuroscience. You saw this TED talk. At the time, I think TED had a slightly different sort of halo around it than it does now. Um, and this talk was by Henry Markham. And you thought, I'm ready to commit the next decade of my life to following this project. Can you sort of just walk us through briefly uh, just your thought process and what was exciting to you and what caught your eye about it? Yeah, it, listen, it did have that halo and I'm almost embarrassed to admit that I was caught up in the halo because I saw I saw the TED talk and I, and I thought, here's a, science, here's a scientist who, I had studied neuroscience at, in college, not majored in it, but taken sort of as many classes in that as I did in my major. So I had, I felt like I really had like gone deep in the, in neuroscience in college. And then we'd been assigned Henry Markram's papers in many of the classes I had taken as like, here's a seminal, you know, a, a pillar of the community type scientist who's written these like cornerstone papers that have made up our contemporary knowledge of the brain. And that's how, that's my like gestalt of Henry Markram before seeing the, the TED talk. And then when he gave the TED talk, I thought, okay, if this if this scientist is such a you know esteemed prolific figure of the community, if he's found a way to simulate the brain in ten years, there's absolutely no reason to doubt that or to to question that up front. This is not um, you know some tech outsider coming to to disrupt neuroscience or to hack it with his new new you know methodology. This is like a very much a neuroscience insider saying he's found this new way to accelerate the field in 10 years. And I had been wanting to make a, a documentary about this field. I had just like, I had gotten into documentary already. I had made my first feature film. And I was thinking like, I wanna do a, a, a film about neuroscience somehow. I, I just didn't know how or what, or it also felt as I explained the film a little bit, it's like, how do you how do you find a story that has a beginning, middle and end in a field that's so kind of open-ended and every study morphs into the next study but here was someone who was like i'm going to i'm going to plant my flag on 10 years so it was all of that wrapped up in into one and my kind of like uh awestruck uh hit from that ted talk led me to to be convinced that this was this was the story to make a film about um and and it would it would give me a tangible out i would have that 10 year you know, I would have that decade. The decade always felt like kind of long enough where it could happen, but short enough where like I I, I reasonably thought I might be still a filmmaker in ten years, and that and so I I uh, went to try to get access, and that's kind of how it began. It's interesting to hear you very you know very clearly draw the line between this very serious academic who was well respected in his field, who you studied and admired, and the sort of tech disruptor figure. Because there's this moment in the TED talk where he says, in 10 years, if we're successful, I'll have a hologram come and speak to you. And that to me is like the apotheosis of like tech promise. Um, like <laughs> we will replace the human in a decade and, uh, and a hologram will come and and, and do this this work instead. And I just, I, I feel like there is, in the same way that like virtual reality is just around the corner and self-driving cars are just around the corner. I mean, these things exist in a certain, uh, at a certain stage, but they aren't at this kind of most developed or advanced version that sort of people in working on these projects have been um, promising for, for decades. And, I guess it's just it's just interesting because I feel like in the film you get into the ways in which these two worlds do kind of overlap or where the kind of tech spirit or narrative or um, mythology kind of permeates the academic world. And I guess I'm curious when you realize that a that that was happening, and I guess also b when this project when you realize that this project might not pan out. Right. 
Yeah, I, I should have listened a little harder in my initial interview with Henry um, because he did mention in that first interview, he, he name dropped Ray Kurzweil a couple times. And I should have I should have clocked that and kind of understood a little deeper where his references were and his um, you know signposts ab about what he was trying to do were. I, I, I wasn't really, I didn't have the consciousness as a 22 year old to understand what a tech disruptor meant to neuroscience uh, a, a, or, or what, a, what a tech disruptor, what someone from Silicon Valley would bring to neuroscience. It, it didn't have a valence to me. Even if I like understood that it, it wasn't necessarily a negative thing or I didn't have any critical approach to that at that point. I wasn't equipped to like think about it that way. Um, and you know these kind of futurists like Ray Kurzweil, I I was drawn to them cinematically. I thought like you're like dreamers and kind of like um, the like crazy Herzogian sense of like these are people who are have some sort of like crazy drive to do something to upload themselves into the cloud. Um, and I and I guess I was maybe a little bit of that 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 mystique of transhumanism certainly had seeped into Henry's. Um, inspiration for this project, but also I think I, I was feeling as a filmmaker, I was feeling the kind of like awestruck quality that many people are confronted with when they when they go and visit these places where people are like cryogenically freezing themselves and stuff. There's some sort of vision of the of the future or, or awareness of the future that most of us in our day to day life um, don't really have much time or energy or capacity to think about. I would later come to realize a lot of that is like from a very privileged position, like a, a sort of class position from people who have extraordinary amounts of money to be able to think about uh, where their consciousness might reside in like a thousand years or whatever. So uh, that anyway, the, the point here is that like over the over the decade, I started in one in this position with hearing these things, but maybe just sort of being drawn to them unconsciously as a filmmaker, feeling like there was something here. But then around the midpoint, I would say, like around the time where there's this, there's this open letter in the film and all these critics kind of come out, I started going around and talking to more critics. And yes, the, the critics were in the film, seeped into my perspective and, you know, colored my, my vision of whether this was a scientific possibility. But almost equally as important to that, I was sort of evolving as a human and I'm becoming like a politically aware subject in society at that point and through you know i made this film like straight through my 20s and i absolutely started in a in a much more apolitical um position than i ended it in and i and that although not not like tangibly in in any direct way that i could put my finger on affected the film it, it absolutely colored the way i saw um the kind of like tech influence on the on the project and the way in which this project felt much more in the end like a Silicon Valley startup than the sort of like corridors of traditional neuroscience that I had studied in, even in my liberal arts college. So, you know, I, I think like that was that was my evolution. Where where your your second the second part of the question, like where did at what point did it seem like this wasn't going to be a possibility? Um I I think like I I got I was still excited at the halfway point where they they relaunched this, what they repackaged it as the Human Brain Project. It was the Blue Brain Project, and then they like did a big rebrand, got, they got a billion euros, and it was the Human Brain Project, and now it was another 10 years. I went on, and it's in the film, I went on MSNBC, and I'm like, it's a 15-year film now, and I was, I was absolutely still gung-ho at that point. Um, it was really the open letter. It was like 800 scientists signing on to this statement, saying that this was, uh, scientifically misguided and uh, the leadership style of Henry Markram was a problem. And then and then a mediation committee having to like grapple with that open letter and then Henry having to step down from the project that he initiated. That was super dramatic for, uh, some, for, for me to have seen him like rise with all of this, the rise and fall of that. I think that's really where I started realizing uh, this decade is not what I initially thought it might be. And I then kind of scrambled to, <clears throat> to figure out what they were going to achieve in a decade and if I would have a film in a decade. And that was a constant question as, as is in the film as I, that I had for people, what will you have by the end of these 10 years? And people would be like, well, what 10 years? You know, I felt like at a certain point, I was the only one who cared about 
who, who was like clocking that initial 10 year promise. Everyone else had updated it, reset it. And so I was like the last auditor in this whole world of people who had forgotten about the initial 10 year promise. And so this, the end of the film kind of um, found itself based on my initial promise to myself that I was gonna make a 10 year film. I just want to go back to something you said about Herzog, which I thought was, it was just an aside, but it's interesting that you mention him because uh, it made me think of his film. I think it's Lo and Behold. Is that right? Mm, yeah. And it's all of these sort of tech visionaries and futurists and people who did really meaningful and important work, people who are affected by technology. But he seems drawn to this idea of the, um, of like the visionary who is also doomed, <laughs> the sort of tragic yes. visionary. And, um, which is obviously tied to this idea of failure in both science and Silicon Valley tech. Um, they have a very high tolerance for failure and a lot of mythology around failure. Uh, and it was sort of interesting to see the path that your film took, you know, alongside the certain pitfalls of this project, because I actually thought that it made it a much more interesting film than if the project had been successful or that's actually, I shouldn't really put a value judgment on it. It's obviously a very different film, but it was one that raised a lot of really interesting questions for me. Whereas a, a story that was just a story of a triumph would be um, a pretty straightforward narrative arc. Like, was there any point at, at which as a filmmaker, you felt like, despite the uncertainty that this was actually going to enrich the film, that this was a much more, um, just a, just a sort of opportunity for you to to dig in a little bit deeper into some of these questions. Yeah, I I, I wish the answer was yes, but it's honestly I, I um kind of tragically for myself it's kind of no. I, I kind of always wanted um, I always wanted something scientifically to happen uh, by by my last visit there that would that would sort of flip the whole narrative on its head that they were a failure and would have a glimmer of life in a way people hadn't seen it before in this thing. Now, I, I like that's that's almost me writing science fiction, though, based on this this documentary I was making. I don't I, I don't know that that's the more interesting ending to this film. I think what you're suggesting is more interesting in a way and more. It's certainly more in line with what we've seen in the last decade of just living in this world that we're in um, and, and the fetishization of failure certainly uh, lines up more with what I ended up seeing and, and, and in, in the way Henry ended up talking to me the, the whole decade was often about, well, we just have to try if no one's gonna, how are we gonna know if this works if no one tries? And a need to kind of run ahead and break things and move quickly. And that, that ethos uh, and, and the need to, to see if see see that it failed, to know that it was a fail, to know that it was a failed I idea, but to have to materialize failure in order for, in order to like materialize failure on on a huge scale too. We're talking about like millions and millions of public funding and public money in this case. It's not just the whims of a of a rich billionaire or something. This is you know a huge idea led by a very successful scientist who had a, a great reputation going into this um to to kind of disrupt neuroscience in many ways and so uh i, I what what did I, I i wanted i want when i started the film i wanted them to turn on a switch and at, at in year 10 and and for this thing to be conscious i did i, I absolutely went into it wanting that in the end I, I kept searching for that, but I actually at the end in the final trip i just wanted an ending i, I just worried that i didn't have I didn't have anything. I just had the same. I had a lot of the same for many years. And you know, there's so obviously there's so much footage that has to be cut and left out and everything. But by that last trip, I was just hoping like there has to be some sense of finality or or a sense of a new beginning or something here in order for this to be a film that I can reasonably complete now in the 10 years that I wanted to make a film. And so that the last trip is when I filmed the scene near the end of the the uh, film where they're talking about the new horizons of 2030 or 2050. Um, and then it's, and then also uh, the moment where they're planning their new film there where they're like storyboarding. And I somehow something about those two moments together 
started to feel like uh, a bit of an ending and an, and a new beginning, like the exactly what I'm, I was kind of looking for, a, a new beginning, a, a repositioning of the horizon, um, a stretching out of the failure <laughs> into time and space. And um, uh, I started to feel like that. And then as we got into the edit, Paired with the Gary Kasparov narrative, which sort of was came later in the process, and this like look digging deeper into the lineage of the IBM Deep Blue, and going at this idea of failure and errors in in code, um, that that started to to make it feel like a film to me eventually. But it was a very long and arduous editing process to get there. I kind of want to ask you about making making work that in, in which the subjects are not famous people or not necessarily seeking this kind of attention. I know Markham is a public figure. He is giving a TED talk. You know, he's he's on the public stage. But a lot of the other people in the film are largely, you know, they're doing their work in uh, not in obscurity exactly, but they're not um asking to be to be made into public figures and I guess I'm just curious how you approach representing people like that I mean I think that um there's always this tension between wanting to represent someone in a way that they recognize themselves and you know feel seen uh by whoever is documenting them or their work but also there needs to be some room for critique like I think that the first is a necessary condition for critique or criticism, um, because otherwise it seems as if it's just coming out of left field and maybe it is. And I'm just curious how you thought about that because there's a humor to certain parts, certain interviews or certain um, shots. You know, I'm thinking specifically of the one with uh, the, the count stuffed animal. And there's like a really sweet comedy to that, but it's also a little bit teasing the subject um, <laughs> for, for his, Sort of earnestness. So I guess I'm I'm just curious how you think about that as a filmmaker. It's something that comes up a lot, obviously, in journalism. Um, this question of of representation in a way that is both uh, honest and fair. Yes. Well, even in the stratosphere of of neuroscience, although these people aren't famous to the outside world, there's there's huge uh, disparities in in power and influence and status in this field and um you know I, I i think that my my conception of that shifts somewhat when i'm talking about someone who's the head of an institute and a sort of world-renowned neuroscientist as far as that's considered within the community um and and someone who's like a junior researcher or a, a postdoc or something who appears in the film briefly so I, I think that e even though you know we're not making a film here about uh, world famous people per se, there are still great stratospheres that people appear in in this film. So for example, Christoph Koch, who's, who has the, the scene with the Count, he, this is someone who's the head of the Allen Institute, who's which is one of the largest neuroscience institutions in the world, who's like published many books, world renowned, speaking all all over the place all the time, much respected. Um, and I, I, you know, I, w I went into film with him and I sort of, he, he gave that, to, he did that for, performed that for me. I wasn't, I wasn't embedded with him for, for weeks or months and, you know, decided to use that moment and whatever. This was like a, a couple, an hour I had in his office with him and filmed an interview and filmed that moment. And he, he's a very colorful character and wants to show that to the world. And I, I, you know, I feel like I can be his vessel for that. So I, I kind of, I consider myself more of a vessel for a moment like that than making a purposeful choice among other choices, especially when it's someone who I have limited time with and they've offered that to me. Um, in the case of like people at the Blue Brain Project or more junior scientists who I may have been around more or have more material with and get to decide more and, and therefore there's more, I think, onus on me as a filmmaker to make those subjective choice decisions about what elements to foreground. I think there there is much more of a uh, ethical calculation about uh, why I'm using something, and if I'm if I'm teasing someone, uh, or if I'm if I'm implicating a lar them as part of a larger point I'm making, um, 
and it's not it's not a personal mistake or fumble that they've made. They're sort of like carrying out the will of their institution. Um, and so I, I, I the, the sort of like institutional uh, moments, and I, I'm thinking specifically of some of the stuff around like visualization, touch screens in the film and the art gallery downstairs and their, their graphic designer kind of like, I'm lingering on him as he as he walks behind the in the gallery down there. Um, these are these are moments that I don't believe read as like uh, uh, personally condemning on one person. He was giving a very earnest and 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 truthful tour about the project. The project itself has this ethos, and it ha it has to be recorded somehow. It comes out through its employees. So I, I think what I always try to do in those cases to, to sort of buffer the people a little bit ethically from judgment is to come in this film at least, and this is the first time I've done this in a film, is to come with voiceover to kind of like set up a, a, a segment or to immediately come at the end of a segment that sort of seems like it has a bit of a critique in it to offer, to kind of like reinforce the critique through my narration so that you understand that I am making a larger point it's not we're not just meant to laugh at this one person or something and move on um, I tried to like own it own the critique there as much as I could right and I, don't, I definitely don't think that there's any part of the film that's mocking its subjects just to be clear and it's interesting to hear you talk about that specific example with the count because um that's an example of someone being generous right generous yes. with uh with their self <laughs> And that's sort of all you ever really want as a writer or as a filmmaker, presumably when you're dealing with, um, you know, when you have someone who gives you an hour of their time. Um, some, a word that has come up a few times is power. And I think when talking about institutional critique and the sort of complexities of representing people who are um, really more avatars for a larger system or institution or organization. Uh, I'm curious how that might tie to what you were saying earlier about kind of coming into a political awareness as this decade um, wore on. I mean, I think it's really interesting that the open letter was published like five years into the project, right? Like right at the halfway point. And that that could be like, that it could be sort of weighted so evenly, um, just seems like, <laughs> uh, kind of a gift, but yeah, I'm just curious how, what that political awareness was like for you, what, what you really meant by that and how it changed your perspective on the work that you were doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, so much, there was so much else going on in this decade that I always, I had a fantasies about folding into this film somehow because the, the terrain of the film overlapped with the terrain of some of the things I'm thinking about, for example, Brexit was going on just at the same moment <clears throat> of this open letter where, um, you know, the open letter was really like all of Europe or much of Europe uh, crying out against this Swiss group that had led the project. And, and, um, and also then, then 2016 and, and, the, and Trump's election, Mark, I remember going over there that year to talk to Mark Rim and and he, him having some like weirdly kind words for Trump before I got my camera set up. And I was like, God, this is really weird. I wish I could capture some of this uh, and make some more explicit political parallels about what I'm, what I'm thinking here. And, uh, you know, in the end, of course, like you're editing the film and it's like, it would be, it, it, feel, it feels at some point insane to try to go on some sort of political di diatribe about what was happening the same year you went over to film in Heidelberg during the summit. You know, it's like, it's just crazy. So the, the asides end up falling away very quickly in the edit and that's fine. But you're, but the, you know, I'm, so like I'm shaping this film and I'm, and I guess all I'm saying by, by my like development as a political subject is just sort of, uh, you know, maybe sort of a shift in my initial awe and reverence of big science institutions um, and a, an awareness that many of much of science funding is driven by uh, so forces of celebrity and uh, more more like pop, well, I guess what in the field would be called like pop science metrics than it is sometimes hard science metrics and the kind of hype cycles that appear in these corridors of traditional science m much more like more and more lining up with in many cases 
Silicon Valley hype cycles. Um, I, I bet that is where my awareness crept in because it was a more global awareness of how some of these forces tied in with other critiques I was developing as a person. So that ends up shaping the film um, because of, uh, there could have been a different version of this film made that's much more, uh, you know, uh, sort of like lends them so much more possibility that this is the right way to understand the brain, but they just haven't done it yet. Um, and doesn't have any sort of critical voice. I, I think that's, if I had just been a 22 year old making the film constantly through, I would have made that film. But weirdly in a longitudinal project like that, this, the filmmaker evolves too. And that's, that's really where this film came from. Yeah, I, I'm, it's interesting. It's, I'm curious if this is like a time scale you'd want to work in again. I mean, that, that comment is really interesting. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, if, let me, let me ask you a question, for example. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, when you, when you're writing a more memoir styled uh, prose, isn't it, isn't it the case in, in a way that you you can track the, the person that's changed from the moment you had your first job at a startup in New York to the person who became more and more disillusioned when you know in Silicon Valley like like it, it in a way I feel like any kind of memoir contains within it the evolution of the author otherwise maybe there's no memoir to be written um, and it just happens that well anyway let me let, well, that, that that's I guess that's a, that's a that's a question to you first, and then we can talk about it more. I mean, do you agree with that kind of reading? Yeah, I think that that's I think that that's true of a lot of personal writing. Um, I think there are a few different ways you can do it. I think you can write from the vantage point of wisdom and and uh, and incorporate that from the beginning. I think when I wrote when I wrote my book, I made the deliberate decision to try to get back into the the mindset that I had at the time which was like this sometimes excruciating process of going back and reading old emails and text messages and talking to friends and interviewing coworkers, you know, who was I in 2014? Um, just devastating uh, project. <laughs> but I, I, and it was painful to get back into that headspace of enthusiasm and of, um, of great excitement about working in Silicon Valley and in tech. And I imagine for you, you have all of these materials. I mean, you, you have like, I, I actually like as a, as a friend of yours, I was weirdly very moved at the end of the sort of montage of you like getting older, um, you know, it captured by your own camera setup. Um, and, you know, I think that you sort of have to figure out how to honestly depict where you were at a certain time. Um, while also using hindsight or wisdom or whatever experience right. as a as a tool to frame it or to contextualize right. it, um, but yeah, I mean, I I I do wonder what it would be like to work on a piece of personal writing for a decade. Um, right. I think if I had written my book over the course of a decade, it would have probably been a really different book and maybe a better book. Um, it was, you know, as it got more, as we we approach the present in that text, uh, I think the writing is more confused. So, um, I mean, this is another conversation for another time, but I think that it can be very, very hard to write when you're very close to the material. And I imagine it's similar um, in documentary film. Yeah, I, I mean, but I but a, a similar um, attempt, that I think I, I, I was making, um, in the in the early parts of this film and this like compressed narrative to to convey the the true enthusiasm and awe I had for this project in those in those first visits that's you know that I absolutely agree with what you're saying about getting back into the mindset you have to you have to otherwise there's no journey to be captured um and it's not so hard to do it's just sort of like I do, I do feel so far from that person that started the journey. So it almost is like imagining a fictional character <laughs> truly at this point, you know, it's almost like, but, but it's of course easy. You have all the material, it's you. Um, but it is, it is, uh, it almost feels like an act of science fiction to 
and just to step back into the the early enthusiasms. Um, yeah. Well, it's an act of dissociation in a certain way. It's like an act of seeing yourself at a distance and um, and not editorializing it too heavily. I mean, I think that you just said something that I wanted to grab. Um, oh, just that that trying to get back into that headspace and depict that enthusiasm that you had at the beginning of this project. I mean, I think if you hadn't done that, it wouldn't have it wouldn't be fair, right? I think if you right. had said, I was always wise to this being- Exactly. You know, yeah. I, I just think that it, it wouldn't have been a very interesting movie because it would have had the sort of um, like sneering over confidence of hindsight. <laughs> right. Uh, and so I think it's fair both to the subjects and also to the viewer that you were very honest about this being kind of an evolution. Yes. And I was thinking a lot about you know, there there was this other film that came out near the near the end of my time making this film um, about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, made by Alex Gibney, mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking a lot about uh, the the way in which people might be looking for for that kind of narrative in this film. They might be looking for the narrative of like a snake oil salesman who dupes everybody into believing something, and then and then it's you know that has the sort of rug pulled out at a certain point, but and, and knowing that, that that wasn't that this was a more nuanced um, situation where where you know many people think that this is a scam and is never going to you know contribute anything meaningful to neuroscience, and yet many other people still seem like they they believe it is, and and the Swiss government continues to fund it, and people come in and audit the project, including Christoph Koch from the Allen Institute. So very important people in the field, including people in, I'd interviewed in the film who had been critical still giving it, lending it some weight and not saying like, we, this must be stopped, you know, this is a scam. And so I, 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 um, I felt like it was, it was more so, it, even more so important for me to convey the way in which I bought into it early on, like you're, like you're talking about, so that I didn't just start the film with this assessment. And there's also this pressure in documentaries too to like make your the opening of your film like the first five minutes sort of like contain the whole argument and then you like pull back you know and this is like a very this is a very like commercial form that i think people look for they kind of want to know what your take is in the in the opening and then you pull back and like tell the story mm -hmm. and 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 i and many people uh suggested as we were showing them this film for notes and stuff like why don't you include some of that later stuff up front, you know, some of the like stuff where you like launch off into this essay about the science and the, the tiny mistakes and everything. Why don't you pull that up to the, and I, I resist, I just push back against that because of exactly what we're talking about. Like if I, if I put, if I do that like sizzle opening with my take of, of everything and then like zoom back when I was 22 and I was just starting, you know, the, it just like, I don't know, it, it cheapens the, 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 the bot, the like, the way in which I need, I need to sell my own conviction at that age. I need to communicate that I really did buy in, and I was awestruck. And so I, the decision was just to go very linear with it and walk through that in in as close to the original feelings as I could describe. Do you think that, I mean, one of one of the things that we are sort of discussing or, or dancing around in different ways is this tension between science and technology. And like, it's interesting to hear you use the word scam because that never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that word to describe an experimental scientific initiative, research initiative. Um, I would use that word to describe like <laughs> certain startup ideas or products that have come out of Silicon Valley or, um, or, or hype or rhetoric or whatever. Um, and so I'm, I guess I'm curious, do you think that this project, like taken alone as a neuroscience research project, do you think that it would have received the kind of blowback or attention if it hadn't been wrapped in the language and aesthetics of technology? Like you have this great part of the film where you're talking about how like, I think, it was like touch screens and visualizations started to become more and more common. Like there started to be this kind of currency of, uh, of like the design of technology around this research project. And I know that there isn't such a clean cut distinction because artificial intelligence is, you know, it's a computer science 
um, arena too. So, but I'm just I'm just curious if you if you feel like maybe that was kind of part of why it it felt like it started to fall apart was this this uh, try not to say intersection, but <laughs> um, this kind of bundling of science and technology. Yeah, I think I think. I think you're right on about that. I, I the 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 parts that people objected to the most were um, very much the emphasis in this project on like visualization technologies, which for for many neuroscience labs would be like if they had a little money left over from their grant, they might buy a, a nicer flat screen for their common area, or you know they might oh I don't know they might like pay an animator to to do some new visualizations for one talk that they were going to, a big talk they were going to give. This is a project that had three, I think, graphics people on staff for, for the, and that, that fluctuated up and down, but they always had at least one full-time person who was like, not a neuros, not a scientist at all, just did animation work and just visualization work, but was a paid staff member of the project and whose responsibility was to continue to create these fly-throughs. And that paired with, you know, buying like that curve screen with the headset technology and various touch flat flat panels with touch technology all around the you know project this was not the anywhere near to the norm in neuroscience projects of of this scale even at the allen institute which is has an even bigger building the blue brain project i did not see any anywhere near this emphasis on visual, pure visualization technology um you know, and, and that that's reflected in the budget, which again comes from public money. So I, I when I started to feel that use of funds and that kind of emphasis over the years, I started to it started to line up with those critiques from Silicon Valley much clearer in my own head. And I and I tried to put that in the film as a result. Um, and I think many other people's critiques echoed that for me. Um, and I think when when other sci neuroscientists see this kind of emphasis on visualization. Where money, where money could go to something else in the project, you know, um, it's sort of a question of like, why? Who are you? Who is that? Who is that serving? And um, ultimately, you know, are are you in a sense storytelling your way to more funding, or do you have a? Is there actually something that's come out of your basic research that is deserving of more funding? Um, or every time you do a presentation. Are you just upping the ante with visual visualization to sort of show that you've progressed? So there's a bit of a, I think, facade um, that comes from the tech influence onto this project. I, I would blame it on, the, on that kind of influence within this project, where you know I I, I too wouldn't call basic research a scam ever. Um, it, it I think the the kind of the kind of like salesmanship that leans on this this visualization technology is where I started to feel the real fallout with the project. Yeah, I mean, right as you're as you're describing that, I'm thinking, right, marketing, like marketing is what makes things makes things feel like a scam. Right, exactly. It's strange for a science uh, for a research project to have marketing. Yes. Um, the way that this one does or did. Uh, I do want to just say, like, on the topic of public money, a lot of the a lot of venture capital funds are funded by uh, public university endowments by um, pension funds, like it's not just private family offices. So I think there actually are analogies um, or comparisons to be made there between the fund in this funding structures, which raises all sorts of other issues for another conversation. Yes. But um, but yeah, I guess I wanted to maybe land on this question actually of marketing and. Um, Markham's team is making a movie to counteract your film. <laughs> um, do you know where that, what stage that project is in? Or can we, can we like, have you seen it? Do you have a sense of whether it will be effective? Do you feel like um, that this will sort of be like that this movie coming out will be an important inflection point for their project? Do you have a sense of how you kind of fit into their story again? Yeah, I don't I, I don't know when their film uh, will come out, but I will say that I I uh, it's not it, it wasn't unusual to see them working on a new film. This wasn't a, like the first time they had done this. In other words, I think it was only the only instance of this kind of meeting I captured 
just by chance from it lined up with one of my visits there, but they've made um, many videos and films over the years to re reintroduce themselves to the world. Um, this will be the new one, the newest one that you know, I, um, listen, it might be even sitting out there on YouTube somewhere with like <laughs> 70 views. I don't even know, but, um, I don't, I don't, I think that it was specifically to counteract my film. Um, the, it, what I'm saying is it's part of a sort of natural marketing cycle that I'd seen them on year after year where they felt like this was just part of their project. They had to repackage the story for the new year. What, what was the, where was the simulation at? How could we incorporate the newest visuals? And it was like, it's just a new opportunity for the, for the visuals to have a, a, a sort of vessel to go out into the world. And so I'll be interested to see it. Uh, I, I think in a, in a, somehow, again, in the Herzogian sense, the sort of like stencil version of it with the 3D avatars is maybe the more uh, truthful version, <laughs> sort of like closer to the core of it actually than whatever they may have filmed after this fact. So I was, Felt very lucky to see the sort of innards of that film um and um yeah i mean i i i don't know how my film will fit into their their story about themselves i know that they really don't like the film or at least that's how they've uh you know broadcast that's the way they've communicated with me indicates that they um have a great distaste for this film and I, I, that's disappointing in many ways because I tried very hard to, to be fair in this film, I felt to them. Um, I had to you know, introduce my own voice uh, and my own critical perspective. And by narrating it, I felt like it was clear that I was doing that, but uh, they feel as if I've you know, um, not been fair to them. And that's, you know, that's unfortunate. Um, I, I don't, so I, I think this film, I think that they won't want this film to, fit into their official narrative and will be working to maybe release their own film, yes. But uh, I, I, I have gotten the feedback and I ha actually had to set up an independent advisory panel made up of three scientists as part of my Sloan, the Sloan funding for the film to review the film at three different stages through post-production, which is unusual, but I actually thought it was great because it, 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 was, uh, it made the film making process a little more like scientific somehow that it had to be peer reviewed by neutral you know scientists and um and so i made it through the you know they 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 found the film fair overall in fact uh, a couple of them at several points during that process thought it could have been harder on markram and the blue frame project and i was kind of like keeping the, the line in many ways so i know that this film will be viewed as unfair and and you know, not anyway, I, harsh and not harsh enough by different communities, including them. And uh, in the end, I tried to just own it through my own narration to make it clear that this is my perspective. Yeah, I, I really relate to that. And I think that if people are criticizing you from both uh, sides of the spectrum, then you're, you've probably succeeded in your goal to be objective, right? If you're not satisfying either camp, then I wouldn't want to claim objectivity, but I I, I would just want to I, I I think maybe a fairness or I don't know I mean I the the objectivity versus subjectivity in, in documentary I think is fraught, and I would only ever be thinking of myself as subjective, and hoping to gain trust you know gain an audience's trust through the way stuff is presented, but. I don't claim objectivity because when you say that to scientists, they'll they'll immediately point at how you're not you're not objective, and I, I don't I don't claim to be. That's fair. I think that's very reasonable and um, and very sensible. Um, I guess my last question for you, <laughs> and then we can wrap up, is this was a huge undertaking for you. It was a decade long. It went in directions you did not anticipate. What are you excited to do now? What questions do you want to ask in your work? What, uh, what's kind of caught your eye? What are you curious about? How will you, um, I don't know, do you, do you feel as if you kind of have been released into <laughs> a world of other potential projects? Well, I've, I've certainly gone of late in, the, in a uh, fictional, in the science fiction direction more and more. Um, I made a, a sci-fi feature called Lapsus uh, that came out this year. And I've written 
a new script and maybe I'll make that next. But in terms of documentary, yeah, it's been a lot on the brain for 10 years, absolutely. Um, if I were to do another documentary film about the brain, about neuroscience at this point, I would, I would, there's, there's actually a scientist who I'm, I'm very interested in from the outside. I've not contacted her or started doing anything yet, but um, her name, she's a, she's a sort of legendary figure in the field. Her name's Eve Martyr. And she just st has studied one circuit in the gut of a lobster for her whole career and has yielded so many insights from that and like is so well revered, you know, respected and revered unanimously kind of in the community for that kind of dedicated work to one circuit in an actual animal. Um, and I think that that in many ways and the, the lessons that have um, that have been gleaned from her from Eve Martyr's work are in many ways like the polar opposite from this project and what I made this film about. And so I might be interested in, for example, looking at that. I, I just feel like I have to kind of run away from this maybe now and look at something very different in the field. Um, but I, I don't know, it, 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 uh, it, it might be that I stay in fiction too for, for some time. So, but it, it, I, I have no regret. I, I think it's funny that I started making this film in ways because of a TED talk, but <laughs> I, I, I leaned into this idea in the film of, you know, the tiny mistakes. And I, even if it was a bit of a sort of strange, you know, quirk or, or you could call it a mistake or something of, of fate to like latch onto a TED talk to start making a film, I, I'm very glad to have like had my, my tether latched to that, um, you know, because it, it led me to things like the, like this idea of tiny mistakes, which has come to be so important to me. And I tried to put as much of that into the film as I could this idea that there might be this little line of dignity separating ourselves from the machines of sort of biological error and chaos is just something that can't quite be replicated necessarily. So I, to, to discover that alone was sort of worth the whole journey for me. Well, Noah, thank you for doing this and congratulations again. Um, this was such a pleasure. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you so much, Anna. It was a really fun chatting. All right. Is that okay? <laughs> we went a little long.